So, Dr. Fletcher, quite a tenure, 54 years as I counted, NIH, and you've accomplished an awful lot, dealt with a lot of public health crisis, but I suspect that one of the things you will be remembered for is how you handled COVID. Thinking back over specifically the COVID pandemic, from your point of view, what are you particularly proud of that you did? And for that matter, is there something that you wish you'd done differently? Well, David, there are a number of things we're proud of. You know, as a director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, we rely heavily on fundamental basic and clinical science in the all of government response to challenges such as pandemics. And our investment and the work that we'd accomplished in the science that led to the successful vaccines that right now clearly globally have saved already millions of lives and will likely save many more in the future. The original work on what the right immunogen, that is what the right component of the vaccine to be used, was really resulting from the work from our group here in, in, in my institute, uh, the Vaccine Research Center, and they're widely recognized for that. There are a lot of people that contributed to that, so I don't want to give the impression that it was only us, but we did play a major role in the successful development of the vaccines that has now had a major positive impact on how we in the United States and the global community has handled the COVID outbreak. With regard to things done differently, you know, David, that question get asked appropriately all the time. And, and what I try to explain to the public is that when you are dealing with the unknown, an evolving outbreak of a virus that you don't have a lot of information about, as the weeks and months go by, you have to be flexible enough to follow the emerging information, the emerging data, in order to make decisions that relate to everything from recommendations to guidelines about what to do. And as we always say, if we knew then in January and early February and then into March of 2020, what we know now, clearly there would have been things that we did differently, particularly a fully understanding of the nature of how this virus spreads, its extraordinary capability of transmitting, which we didn't fully appreciate. The fact that 50 to 60% of the transmissions occur from a person who has no symptoms at all, but who is infected. That is a huge issue that would have changed a few things, as well as the fact that this is aerosol spread, not just by the kind of droplets that generally are spread by other respiratory infections such as flu. So it gets down to the things you have to be flexible enough and humble enough to realize that you don't know everything right in the beginning. And you've got to make decisions based on the data as it evolves. And when the data changes and the information changes, you have to adapt to it. One of the things we've seen uh, throughout this is, uh, if I could put it this way, the politicization of science. I mean, you're a scientist, you lead a team of scientists, and yet it has become so political. Uh, I think many people would think that that was not a good development. But from what you see, is there any way that we can change that going forward? Is there things that people in the government, those of us in the private sector can do to take some of the politics out of science? Well, that would be certainly a desired and admirable goal, David. But it is very difficult now when you look at the level of divisiveness in our community. I mean, th there will always be political differences and ideological differences, but they have become so intense, you know, even before we had COVID-19, but they just culminated in a degree of intensity that is brought out when you're faced with a stressful, an incredibly stressful situation like an outbreak that started in the last year of an election year, in the last component of election year. Put that all together, and unfortunately, what happened is something that never should have happened. Namely, that we, in many respects as a nation, lost sight of the fact that we have a common enemy, the virus, not each other. And it seemed that the political differences turned into profound divisiveness. So I hope that that turns into a lesson learned, 
not only for the remainder of this outbreak, but for the inevitability of other outbreaks that we will face in the future, that we've got to pull together as a nation when you have something that's commonly threatening all of us, as opposed to the kind of divisiveness that we have experienced and to this day continue to experience. I wonder, Dr. Patrick, looking back now, do you think that we are better equipped to deal with the next pandemic than the last? And let me sp start domestically, and then we can go globally. Domestically now, the CDC is admitting they have to really rethink some of what they do. Uh, it, it didn't uh, necessarily measure up to what we expected or needed. Are we better equipped for the next one domestically? Well, we can be if we learn the lessons. I, I couldn't say that at this moment we are, but I think you take the example of the CDC. It is true that the cultural issues at the CDC were not optimal for the nation to face such a challenge as this global pandemic. But the good news, David, is that they now realize that, and they are going to try and rectify the things that essentially were the fundamental core reason why things did not go as well. So if we as a nation learn that lesson, hopefully the CDC will learn that lesson. All of us, all of us have lessons to learn. And I believe if we heed those lessons, we will be much better off the next pandemic when it occurs. Hopefully not for a very, very long time, but they are unpredictable and we don't know when it will occur. I was asking about domestically, but let me turn to globally also. A, a version of the same question, because it strikes me that during the great financial crisis back in 2008, 2009, more or less the globe came together to address it. I'm not sure I at least saw that with respect to this pandemic. There was a lot of divisions uh, internationally, certainly with China, but not just with China, with other nations as well. Yeah, David, you bring up a very good point. You know, prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, there was a global health security network where we were trying to get all the nations of the world to realize that whenever you have an infectious disease outbreak, it almost never, particularly when it's a respiratory-borne virus, it's almost, it's almost never confined to a single country or a region or a continent. It becomes global. And if we want to essentially be all in unison in fighting this, We've got to cooperate and collaborate and be very, very transparent. You mentioned China. It is unfortunate that we don't have that kind of transparency that we would have liked to have had right from the very beginning. And hopefully, as we go forward, that lesson will be really imprinted on us that we can do much better when we act like a global community as opposed to a regional or national community. Dr. Fauci, uh, during your 54 years at, at the NIH, as I say, you dealt with a lot of big crises. Let's go back in time a little bit to AIDS and talk about how that was different from and similar to what we saw with COVID. It strikes me that one similarity was initially President Reagan did not want to even mention the word AIDS. Uh, similarly, President Trump early on was saying it's just going to go away. Part of the job of somebody in your position is to go into the Oval Office from time to time and say, we've got some really bad news and you're not going to want to hear it. What have you learned about how to do that? Is there a way to make that more effective with the president, or is it up to the president? Well, it really is up to the president. Uh, I mean, I tried, as you know, my very best to have the facts and the science guide us. And at first, that seemed to be the case. But then after a while, that broke down, uh, which was really unfortunate when we were having claims of drugs that worked that did not. There was no evidence whatsoever, for example, a number of them, but hydroxychloroquine is the good example. The statements from the leadership, as high as the president saying that this is going to go away like magic when we knew it wouldn't, that is not helpful. So we've got to make sure that when we do get in the future outbreaks that we realize the extent of it. The similarity that I say is what you said in the beginning, there wasn't the full recognition or the use by President Reagan of the bully pulpit to bring the bully pulpit of the presidency to bring proper attention to the entire country. Because remember, early on, it was felt to be, and still to some extent is in this country, very heavily weighted to men who have sex with men. But we know globally this is a virus, HIV, that can affect anyone and is particularly devastating 
in a heterosexual way in countries in the developing world, particularly sub-Saharan Africa, which has about 67% of all the infections in the world. The differences are really important. Um, we knew what the virus was from the very first week with COVID. It took us a few years to figure out what the virus was with HIV. I mean, we began noticing cases in 1981. There probably were many cases that went unnoticed before 1981. It wasn't until 1983 and 1984 that we developed the, the knowledge of what this was, that HIV was the cause of this syndrome, which we named AIDS. The other thing is that we rapidly, in record time, unprecedented, developed a vaccine for COVID-19. We still don't have a vaccine for HIV, although we have very, very good, spectacularly good therapies that have saved the lives of millions of people. So you're right, David, there are some similarities and some profound differences between 1981, when we first noticed HIV AIDS, before we even had the word HIV, and 2020, when we first were confronted with COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Fauci, you have now announced that you're going to be stepping down sometime before the end of the year here. And I have to ask you, uh, does that reflect, at least in part, your conclusion that this COVID problem is not going to be over the next six to 12 months? Because it strikes me, at least, that if you thought it was going to be done in six months, 12 months, you'd stick around for the victory lap. Well, you know, I wouldn't say, <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily say a, a victory, lap, victory lap. I was thinking, considering, you know, vaguely, but sometimes specifically about stepping down at the end of the Trump administration in order, as since I say, and I'll say it again, since I'm healthy and I'm energetic and I'm still passionate about doing other things outside of the confines of the government, I thought that might be a good time. But when President-elect Biden, after he was elected and before his inauguration, one of the first things he did was to ask me to be his chief medical advisor, and I gladly was honored and said, yes, of course I would. I thought I would be doing that for a year, because as you said, David, I thought after yet again another year, we would have COVID behind us. But as it turns out, that's not the case. But what I examined and, and, and felt would be the case when I made the decision that I had been thinking about for some months, and I announced it just a short time ago, is that I believe we're in a position now we're much, much better off. We have vaccines. We've just got to get more people vaccinated and more people boosted. But I think we're really on the threshold of getting COVID to the point where it is at a level where it is low enough that we can actually not have it disrupt the social order. And we can, it's not going to disappear, David. It's not going to be eradicated and it's not going to be eliminated. But I believe we can get it to a low enough level if we do the right thing, if people get vaccinated who are not vaccinated and those who are not boosted get boosted. I think that time is coming. I hope we get to that within the next few months. That's the reason, among other reasons, why I decided the timing was right to step down. Dr. Fauci, you've had a long and truly remarkable uh, career of public service here. Uh, you've done an awful lot of good. You've paid some prices as well, particularly in recent days where we've seen threats against your life and even against uh, the life of your family. Even last night, uh, the governor of Florida said something I will not repeat because I find it reprehensible about you. Did that, was that a factor in your decision to step down? David, really it wasn't. As, 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 as most people might say, well, it has to have been. It really was not. I mean, that's something that's very unfortunate that the country has come to a state where even politicians are saying things that are triggering thoughts of violence and harassment against me and my family. But that's just the state of our nation. I accept that. I don't like it. But David, really, quite honestly, that did not enter into my decision to step down. One last question, Dr. Fauci, if I may. Uh, I worked at Capital Cities, the company Capital Cities, and we had a tradition uh, that senior executives would leave a note in their desk for their successor, maybe a little bit like presidents do for their successors. Uh, what would the note say to your successor that you left in your desk? Yeah. Stick with the science and make sure you stay away to the best of your ability from the politics and the political divisiveness, because we are scientists, we're public health officials, and we have to be separate from what we're seeing right now with the political divisiveness. That's what I would say 
as point number one. And point number two is don't ever underestimate what an emerging infection can do, because what it looks like when it first emerges may not be what it really turns out to be, and it must and it might be much worse. So those are the two points that I would put on that piece of paper, David.